Okay, what I thought of doing today is basically um, I'll speak a little bit about the animism exhibition, but under a special set of concerns or from a particular angle, um, mainly, you know, trying also to sh to basically share doubts and concerns with you as they are still in the in the cooking in the making and uh, um, this is a photogra photo photography by uh, Candida Höfer um, that was part of the different iterations of the animism exhibition um, and functions a little bit like as what one could call a kip figure, no? a, a multi-stable or invertible figure. Um, because there is a kind of ambiguity in this image as to whom acts on whom, as to who presents a danger for what. You know? and, and exactly this kind of tilting, the moment where one imagines, you know, something to act on this, meaning to be the agent on a patient or the reverse. I think to inhabit or to delineate or to um, position oneself and in the making of exhibitions, uh, others at this tipping point, that's sort of um, what, I, what I try to think through with um, um, for myself and with all my collaborators when we construct an exhibition. This kind of tipping point that I hope I will be able to explain in, in what follows in terms of you know, various kinds of vocabularies that are more or less suited to describe this uh, situation. Um, the kind of meridian point between an active and a passive vector. Um, so. What you see here is two restorators from the Berlin Ethnographic Museum working on objects that we don't really see in detail in these protective suits. Um, and yeah, as I mentioned, you don't really know, are they protecting themselves from something contaminated, contagious or otherwise dangerous that these objects um, that is part of these objects, or are they acting rather in order to protect the object from the human body, you know, from the, the fact that, of course, our bodies are always influencing whatever we touch and what is around us. So maybe these objects are just so fragile that, you know, this kind of sweaty human body is a threat to them, right? We could well imagine that. Um, so, in a way, this, this photograph, together with a series of others that you know, also depict a canon of ethnographic institutions, such as the Pitt Rivers Museum, the Musée Cambrely, they were always used in the like, first few rooms or situations that one encountered when entering the animism exhibition to, to invoke this kind of ambiguity between as to whom acts on whom, um, especially when it comes to that rather obscure practice of collecting ethnographic objects. Um, but before returning to the animism exhibition, I will go somewhere completely different. Um, because I can't really respond to the proposal um, of Marilyn Strassen that we have been confronted with here. I thought, you know, if I were to respond to questions of scale, then probably through posing the question of 
reversal of figure ground relations and reversal of vectors of agency, as I just started to introduce them, on a kind of um, scale of, on, on large scale versus micro scales. So um, what you see here is basically the first, or the third, I think, the, fir the third picture that was shown in an exhibition that is largely forgotten. Recently, uh, two PhD students from Columbia University have dug it, dug it kind of up and revived scholarship about this exhibition, a UNESCO exhibition, um, UNESCO organized exhibition uh, on human rights um, from 1949. Uh, so, you know, six years or something like that earlier than the Family of Man exhibition, but very much in line with this kind of post-war universalist project of, uh, um, of constructing a kind of planetary humanity, you know, um, of a rhetorics of universalism that at least by intention had to replace um, the uh, previous dominant rhetorics um, of, you know, a, colo a colonial universalism, the, the universalism of uh, the uh, mission civilatrice, uh, the universalism of uh, of a colonial frontier, um, into you know from a kind of uh, regime based on inscribing. Uh, difference to this paradigm of, of the family of men. This exhibition, the UNESCO exhibition, was an utter failure, um, unlike uh, the family of men, no? Steichen's exhibition. And partially because they really did not succeed to find a visual language for human rights. Somehow nothing fits. The signifiers are strategically out of joint with what they signify. <laughs> Um, it's a kind of almost surreal uh, process trying to understand how did they try to visualize and communicate the universality of human rights. Um, because they didn't have these anchors of sort of the, the, the anchors of, you know, the kind of drama of life that Steichen set in motion, right? So it had no anchor. It was free-floating. It was... Um, in a sense, in a kind of vertigo, um, which I think is beautifully present in this rather obscure picture here, which I guess shows Adam and Eve in space flight. I mean, that is obviously the beginning of the space age. You know? um, and I like to think of the space age perhaps as a as a moment in a in a collective dream, as a moment in a transformation of um, frontiers of colonial frontiers and the kind of the definitions of what colonial means here I hope to be able to clarify um, <clears throat> where the space age itself is in a way a collective articulation of a dream of ontological alterity the dream of different worlds that space, that space age that is really directed outwards, that is really expansionist, that is basically the direct continuation of a colonial frontier dream, but directed not at the surface of planet Earth, but at other planets, other worlds. No? Imagining, if you think in speculative realism terms, right, the biggest possible correlational circle obviously is that planet, right? Where here somehow humans strangely Cartesian like float outside that circle, but are at the same time bound to it, directed towards it, even to this kind of, you know, the image of the cradle of mankind with its bizarre borders, which are neither purely geopolitical nor um, otherwise intelligible, but definitely most prominent. What you see here is the Congo basin, right? Um, so 
you know, kind of origins and heart of darkness and Adam and Eve and figure and ground, right? The making of a kind of a humanist picture, the rise of the human figure, but also the detachment. You know? And this is 49, um, which in Anthropocene speech, in Anthropocene kind of talk, that is the very beginning of what is called the Great Acceleration, um, which is that kind of process of an acceleration of capitalism and modernist development that fundamentally changes exactly that figure-ground relationship between you know, a stable background, a stable surface, a kind of Holocene-like, agricultural-like dream of nature and planetary environmentality as, as a stable background that allows that figure of the humanist subject to rise. <clears throat> this is you know, another picture from this UNESCO exhibition, um, printing figure into ground the human footprint, which is what also geologists, of course, use to describe inscription of human action into geological scale, time, and matter. I think that, I just wanted to suggest that, you know, in order to think ourselves or to position ourselves when we talk about things like agency of objects, animation, animism or so, I would always try to find ways of thinking this, what, what Benjamin called the now of recognizability. Why, why are we talking about this? And what, what makes it actually possible to talk about this? And in what way is talking about it itself conditioned by a frontier condition? In, in what way is the possibility of recognizing and speaking about these things part of a set of transformations, not just a critical operation, right? A critical operation that may itself be utterly instable in the definition of its own positionality, in its being external in descript describing a situation. Um, <clears throat> Climate change, you know, obviously, in terms of, you know, somehow um, sensing both technologically and psychophysiologically, perhaps, is becoming an ontological force no? or a force of ontological instability, which renders basically the ground groundless. You know, it's kind of like the equivalent of the seismic, of seismic movement, making the ground move. Um, yeah, this is before we had photographs or a lot, like just a few years after the very first photographs were made of um, other planets and planet Earth, um, illustrations that uh, were hugely pop popular in the 50s um, by Chesley Bonestell. Um, just as you know, an example of that dream condition of the space age, of dreaming of other correlational circles, of dreaming of other worlds, which I think has to do with the question of you know, modernity, social change, the ability to bring into being other worlds, other conditions of being, and animating them, meaning making them livable, and the underside of that dream, no? the, the frontier side of that, of that dream. Um, in a way, you know, as reading speculative realism and its attempt of exiting the correlational circle as a symptom would also inscribe it into that question of, an, of, a f 
of a frontier of a frontier of colonial modernity and its relation to its mobilization, its picturing, its um, putting into motion figures of alterity. And I think I promised in my abstract I want to talk about this double face of, or the, the Janus face of alterity. Um, but before I get back to that with regards to the animism exhibition, just one way of talking about frontiers and the current transformation of frontiers and how we could maybe become specific about the kind of figure ground um, transfer and inversions and medialities um, that, we that we are experiencing or undergoing. Um, one way of talking about this frontier with a, with a kind of conceptual um, armature from the early Bruno Latour um, here in, in dialogue with Harun Farocki's uh, work. Um, so what you see here is uh, a still from Parallele, Parallel by Harun Farocki, one of his last works which dealt with the history of uh, computer game iconography and its relation to cinematic iconography or the early cinema in relation to the early computer game, the kind of hyper-realism of CGI um, and the fundamental transformation that CGI images perhaps stand for in in their kind of double-sidedness, you know, being on the one hand part of a kind of um, realm of entertainment and, you know, the, the animated liquid crystal screen environment in, through which we move that promise oceanic forms of being with, of relationality, of communication, of uh, um, being moved and moving. Um, and on the other hand, their application uh, in military contexts as what Harun called ideal typical maps. Ideal typical maps means because reality gradually for this kind of images, insofar they become operational images, um, is measured by the image, by the standard of the image. And reality, the image is, the perf is what represents a degree of perfection a kind of a question of the resolution of the map, right? and the image registers as an operational sensor reality as deviation from the image. Right? So when drones fly over territory that they survey, they register everything that's different from what the image that is stored in the camera eye knows. Right? So an ideal typical image that registers reality as deviating, as movements that are not part of the algorithmic patterns that are, you know, conditioned, circumscribed, framed as what we know as, you know, or what, what is programmed as the realm of, like, tolerant, tolerance, one could perhaps call it, like, movements that are part of an, a certain algorithmic pattern. Um, Latour, um, in, in the late 70s, he started working with a primatologist, Shirley Strum, who counts as one of the proponents of the feminist primatology um, contested term, of course. Um, and they were working on what constitutes the, the basic... Uh, what they called a social link. Yeah? Like the, this was part of a whole kind of redescription of, of what is the subject matter of sociology and how are we talking about society and the social. Um, and a lot of these modelings of you know, society and the social in American science in particular um, was, was kind of using primate societies such as baboons um, as 
models through which one could you know, describe patterns in human society. So they come up with a way of describing baboon society through, in its difference to human society, um, by using a pair of concepts, um, the complex and the complicated. I will not go into details of what they describe. It's fascinating the way they describe baboon society and the way they describe how narratives of the origin of society themselves are performative, how they create the form of sociality that they describe. Um, but I'll just elaborate on this complex, complicated thing because I think that helps us to understand. It's, it's one way to describe a frontier because in a way you could say the frontier of modernity, meaning the arrival of modernity in its kind of um, techno-developmental complex rather than its um, delirious uh, uh, ideological contents, um, is the advance of turning complex realities into merely complicated ones. Basically what they say is that Complicated is everything that can be computed, is everything that can be contained within um, a calculation. So com complicated can be really complicated, but it more or less knows the margins of... Um, um, it, it can more or less frame unpredictability. So the timetable of the Parisian metro, that's complicated. But it's everything in there can be computed. Right? Um, that's an example they later use when they study the Parisian metro or the attempt in the 80s to fully automate the Parisian metro. Um, complex is everything that is sort of, in a way, so full of animate unpredictabilities that in a way one could say, you know, like a conversation in a bar. It is, there are so many factors, and obviously that's an old problem of sociology. You know, there's so many factors that it's very difficult to, to bring all of them into a constellation that can be turned into um, something subjected to, you know, to use an earlier vocabulary, instrumental knowledge. You know? numbers, grids, etc. So there is this echo, the echo with Frankfurt School thinking about, um, you know, enlightenment being the advance of instrumental knowledge and of um, the extirpation of animism, right? The kind of disenchantment idea. A computed conversation at a bar, until recently, just wasn't quite animate, right? There's, a, there's an animation question here that one doesn't really have to pure, one should not confuse yet with a, with a vitalist question. It's, a, it's a, a different register. And I like to think of this different register in terms of figure and ground, so that um, in, in a certain way, in, within the complex, the register of the complex, any act is potentially transformative. You know, like it potentially can transform um, all a all actants in the in, in in a given situation. Right? So there is this kind of idea of you know a potential kind of face-to-face -face, um, dialogism, right? Where um, you enter a conversation and you may exit it completely transformed. Um, the opposite, or very different from the Parisian metro entering into a station and leaving again, right? It shouldn't leave transformed. So it's a, it's a question of to turn complicate, uh, complex matters into complicated one is a process of stabilization. It's the creation of stable backgrounds which allow new figurations, new mobilities. It shifts the terrain of the complex into other realms the moment there is um, any um, more or less relatively stable new background created through 
complex apparatuses. Right? So obviously when you look at any movie of a catastrophe scenario, it, it is always this breakdown of the stable background that then obviously also changes the entire form of being, the life forms, this, this, uh, the forms of sociality. Right? It's a radical shift on the continuum of stable relative stabilities and relative mobilities and figures and grounds. Can you follow me so far? <clears throat> In a way, I think, you know, the kind of techno environmental and environmentality that we're currently experiencing, which I take increasingly to be the, con the condition of possibility for us to be talking about things animist. Um, and that's an ambivalent issue because it means that maybe we're not quite talking so much about anything to do with the, f with the, n with the kind of you know, negative history that is inscribed in modernity's relation to or the constructions of animism. Um, that this kind of techno-environmentality, which is basically the result of um, more or less, one could say, the cybernetization um, of the post-war era and the ability to to speed up, to kind of increase the, the, the frontier that, that translates complex into complicated in unprecedented ways. Right? Now, think of something like the dream that followed the space age otherworldliness um, artificial intelligence right also a kind of in a way an, an, an engagement with alterity although of course a very different one now there is something in in the history of artificial intelligence that i think is helpful to think through this it has to do with the fact that still today it is very difficult for CGI animators to create certain kind of semblances of the organic and the animate. I mean, they're kind of able to do almost everything, right? So, which is why it's become so boring to watch films because it's just like um, somehow it becomes so random, right? Um, <clears throat> and so cliched, the, the, the kind of uh, effects that are produced there. But they're still not quite able to produce walking and some other things. But walking is a very interesting basic case. Like they still look like mechanical, right? There's still this little rest of the uncanny valley kind of things, you know, where you kind of, ah, it's a machine, right? It's not quite alive. It's not quite. Um, Obviously, because walking is somehow, I don't really understand the, de the, the minute details of why that is the case, but there is something in the, there's something physiologically so absurd about us walking <laughs> that it's really difficult to reproduce. So the solution that is found for that, why we don't see a lot of kind of mechanical walking figures in CGI generated movies, is obviously because of that kind of technology, the technology that was used by uh, Avatar and others, you know, this kind of very reminiscent of kind of uh, early proto-cinematic um, physiological studies such as Marais or Mybridges, you know, this kind of, um, kind of using the body as um, a way of inscribing movement and notating it and then recomposing it you know, formatting it towards the assembly line or towards other ends, right? To kind of um, capture of life processes and movement by uh, apparati. This is here juxtaposed with another still from an, a Harun Faroki film, because in a way, for those of you who know his work, many of the of his works are really almost an ethnography of the frontier of. Com com of complexities being turned into the complicated um, advancing in, in its move from 
a kind of disciplinary society to a society of control. And this move from disciplinary to society of control or industrial to sort of post-industrial and the role that objectification and subjectification play in this turn um, is marked by an inversion. An, an inversion that has to do with this artificial intelligence question walking, which is not quite artificial intelligence, but in artificial intelligence, the, f the expectations in the 50s, 60s, 70s were that shortly we are able to produce complex complexity. No longer just complicated, but complexity, dynamic complexity, and that will when, when machines start to sink, right? Then there follows a period that some call the winter of artificial intelligence. Winter here referring basically to the fact that they didn't match up to the horizon of expectation, and funding froze for about 15 years until like the rise of Google and this new, this new period of artificial intelligence. But in this winter of artificial intelligence, the frontier has completely shifted. Like there was a figure ground inversion. Because when you think of what artificial intelligence tried to do is like recreate somehow, you know, the the machine in the, in the image of the human, no? like to, to produce a brain, to produce a machinic organism, if you will. They no longer, I mean, they try, there's still these images around, but that's not at all what's at the core of artificial intelligence anymore. Basically, all of these processes of the complicated and the surplus, the various kind of instabilities and surpluses that float in these realms of the complicated are no longer been tried to, to reproduce, uh, they, don't no, they, don't, they no longer try to reproduce them by computing them. They rather frame existing life processes and let these life processes inscribe themselves into the machine, right? So this is basically the techno-environmentality co consists of a kind of frame of the fact that somehow the complicated has become our environment in which we enact more or less complex actions which permanently enhance and kind of push this frontier of the complicated further. That's what is what algorithmization is, right? That's what it means to permanently feed the machine with live data out of which it can produce patterns and new new calculations of not complexity, but the complicated, right? And margins of operation, border management. <clears throat> it's a visualization of uh, our satellite environmentality. <laughs> Now, this is again still from Parallele by Harun, um, one of the four chapters of this um, uh, video essay on computer game iconography and CGI methods um, looks only at the, the way computer games design the edge of the world. Like, where does this world end? Like, what, can you actually ac exit? Can you find a door out? In most games, actually not, right? In most games, you just w run against invisible walls um, or fly or whatever. But some also have this kind of rather obscure moments of, you know, actually exiting a world and floating into this nihilist nothingness, <laughs> um, which is how this chapter um, of parallel ends. Now, uh, in terms of thinking through frontiers, I would just think, you know, how do we build a relationship between narratives at the edge and images, somehow at the edge where both the ability to represent or to narrate break down. 
so somehow at the at the 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 edge of the frontier perhaps at its uh, turning point but also knowing that one is implicated with what whatever one thinks and does in the, in, a, in frontier mechanisms and their syntax into kind of you know their their power to map and create um, This is just a few images from the Forensis exhibition that uh, I staged with, based on the work of uh, Eyal Weizmann and his group of researchers. Um, I'm showing this just because of the question of the, the agency of matter and materiality, new materialisms, and um, just as an example of how I in this context of Eyal Weizmann's work, uh, how we dealt with it and how we, f f you know, described certain um, uh, mechanisms of uh, of figure ground inversions, reversals, etc. So um, the Forensis exhibition starts with a shift from the subject to the object that maybe is not. Uh, sorry, yeah, a shift from the subject to the object, which is basically what Weizmann and Keenan call the age of the witness, um, of testimony, of speaking out, of speech breaking down, of trauma being, trauma itself being evidence to what they call the forensic turn where the object is charged with speaking. You know, how far this whole forensic turn thing holds is a different question. It's a narrative device that uh, that produces certain possibilities of thinking and so on. Um, forensis comes from the Greek forum and basically means to the creation of a forum for which you need a thing and you need the construction of a thing that becomes relevant to what we say about it. Right? So forensis is not just uh, CSI, but CSI can point us to important aspects of a forensic imaginary um, and what it means, you know, what what kind of border policing happens in our symbolic universes, no? sort of a murder tears a hole into the fabric of the symbolic order and then panic, panic, and panic, et cetera. So this is, um, maybe to think more in that way about forensics, but also, of course, forensics as a state power as a kind of power of um, of inscription and identification, yeah. whereas forensis maybe at least in in Weizmann's universe a counter state practice that brings that brings materialities into processes of contesting state power rather than um, acting in its service. It starts with the bone, that paradigmatic object of the forensic turn, and the bone, the bones of Mengele, the bones of uh, the victims of dictatorships, the anonymized bone that is being re-subjectified by identification, by giving it a name, right? The mass grave, um, DNA process, um, etc. But of course, you know, excavation as a paradigm is obviously also a figure ground transformation of un like of bringing the figure back from the undifferentiated ground of giving it a face again just to bring up this kind of you know like a scale of of transformations from what figuration <coughs> and grounding and ground may may be translated into processes of objectification and subjectification of having a face, not having a face, of having a status, you know, like a figure in the forensic context really would be ultimately the subject of rights, the legal subject of rights. Um, then, just a historical kind of footnote you know, on from the history of forensics as a as a police 
Policing Science. Um, this is a recreation by, of Nabil Ahmed of a Victorian wallpaper from the 19th century, um, widely used in Victorian houses back then, um, that contained large amounts of arsenic. The history of forensics as a science is intimately tied to the method that made it possible to test for arsenic. And like to, because arsenic was a very widely used method to murder unwanted, undesirable subjects. Um, but there's an interesting confusion around this history because in fact, there were such high concentrations of arsenic in the environment that most likely thousands of subjects of uh, um, suspects were judged um, falsely, <laughs> were um, imprisoned on grounds of arsenic evidence that was actually not, that was actually environmental, that actually came from the wallpaper. So the house, the environment kills, right? Environmental violence, this is what we tr introduced through this motive in the exhibition. This is when, when the ground begins to act. And environmental violence obviously is also a very important component of colonial violence. The one aspect of coloniality, I, I believe, that allows us to think through the continuities between climate change and early colonialism. Now, just a little anecdote on this. Anthropocene debates are now largely inside the discipline of geology, largely about when did it begin, right? They're looking for the so-called golden spike. If we no longer live in the Holocene, but in the Anthropocene, meaning if we live in, a, in geological terms, in a new geological age, in which humans, whoever that may be, or the forces of capital have transformed into a geological force on both molecular and molar levels. Um, for them, right now, this is question that is rather unimportant for us, when did it begin, is the key question. You know, some would say with the beginning of agri agriculture, right, that's when humans really started to remake the ground, to stabilize the ground in order to rise as the, as the humanist figure. That is basically the story of most museums, told in most museums, no? that sort of... Um, some say, you know, the steam engine or the nuclear explosion, uh, etc. But Nature, the magazine Nature, in its latest issue presents a different suggestion that is really highly interesting. It's based on ice core probes from the Arctic, which is how we are able to know about past climate um, conditions you know, and trees and other things, of course, but uh, largely ice core probes. Do I have time still? How much? Probably, approximately? 20? Okay, so I need to be quick. Okay, so basically they found in the ice core um, a huge, what is it? Increase of yeah, a drop in CO2 levels, planetary drop in CO2 levels in the 16th and 17th century. Like, unexplicable at first, right? Until somebody made the connection with, with the conquest of the new world and with genocide. With basically the, the, <coughs> the destruction of the Amerindian cultures and the, the forest taking over. And the forest is what produced the drop in CO2 levels. So they suggest to use this drop in CO2 levels at the origin of European colonization of the New World as the marker of the Anthropocene, which I find a very interesting coupling of frontier genocide and climate histories. I mean, 
as I have 20 minutes only left, um, I need to be, uh, I need to choose a bit. This is a kind of primal scene of of the colonial frontier and its, rela and its kind of re relation of thinking, of enacting subject, object, thing, person, agency, vectors, right? It's a scene of the arrival of a missionary, of a Christian missionary, cutting down what is called the fetish tree, the, that sort of you know, emblematic, wrongly animate objects, object, you know, that m mere thing, a mere tree that natives believe have, has this or that power. So it's actually an illustration from a children's book that is in the collection or was in the collection of Walter Benjamin who kept a large collection of children's books, um, illustrations from the world of the missionaries. And that's the first image that you get. Um, the, the animism exhibition was in a way trying to follow some vectors of what hap you know, what is the kind of, how does the, the, the frontier implicit in this scene and in remaking the vectors of agents and patients on who acts on what and what kind of medialities it allows and doesn't allow or, or forbid, um, such that um, you know it, it it is conceived almost like a stage on which on which on which uh, you know as aesthetics, certain iconographies almost like um, appear like in a theater play. Like um, it is a mechanism and it, it draws a stage and that stage calls for certain appearances. Um, given the, the time question, I just wanted to maybe boil it down to the, to the following. Um, I think that particularly with regards to the kind of um, new materialisms, the emphasis on, on animate matter, on a kind of matter in becoming and uh, so on. I think that increasingly, um, I believe that it needs to be supplemented or almost like perhaps corrected um, by something that one could perhaps call uh, a critical mediumism, right? Not just a new materialism, but a critical mediumism. Um, in the sense of what does it mean to be acted upon? What does it mean to be acted upon in particular milieu configurations? Now, why? Because I think that the, our own processes of cultural figurations of which our processes of subjectivation are largely to various degrees of course um, part have left us with a kind of almost an illiteracy an, an, an inability to to explicate to externalize to objectify that part of the vector of um, the diagram of agency, right? That part where one is not acting, not inscribing, like in the kind of, you know, Aristotelian, Marxian way, you know, humans produce work on matter, passive matter, and that's the whole subject object geography that has dominated our figure ground understanding for, the, for millennia, in fact. Um, but this productionist ideology, one could also call it, that is fundamentally ungrounded through, uh, through the kind of techno-environmentalism of cybernetic framing of life by computing processes, I think um, brings to the fore that we do not have, that our very languages um, are extremely tied to this productionist mode, right, to, to acting, but rather not, we don't have a, a very elaborate language to conditions of being acted upon. Right? And 
the lack of this language is exactly why it is so relatively easy at the moment for the kind of you know the, the captures the capturing of life processes that that current capitalism consists of right this kind of increasing indistinguishability this kind of collapse of differences where you can't tell apart anymore what is um, you know where, where you cannot make the difference anymore between your own emotions even thoughts and and systemic conditions a kind of inability to objectify right and the, i think that one could also think of animism this is of course you know a kind of post script on on an animism exhibition um, almost as a clinical symptom of the inability to objectify um, and as you know i think that maybe we are looking into the wrong direction i mean this is obviously i'm not saying that we is here just just an operator right it's not a I'm just saying that m they, maybe one can gain something from just trying to understand the tendency or why are we charging the animist um, effect, which is basically an effect of possible, yeah, of a kind of relationalism, relation, like mediumism perhaps, no? of uh, perhaps also of ontological uh, transformation. Um, what are the conditions of possibility for us to charge this realm of thought, of thought pictures, of desires, um, with you know the, the the qualities of being a possible remedy? Um, so. The problem somehow seems to me that the current discursive tendency seems to resolve things in relations, right? In in a kind of ongoing immanentization of understanding how one is in relation. That's obviously an, a process that is ongoing for a rather long time, like perhaps connected to second order cybernetics of inscribing the observer into observed systems but in general with a kind of large anti-cartesian agreement or perhaps even exorcism right like uh, as the general good of discourse our tendency is to exercise cartesianism to undo that kind of alienated um, external um, fake transcendent subject um, of, of the Cartesian uh, configuration. <clears throat> the problem is that from within that inscription and immanence, it is increasingly difficult for us to, to make meaningful differences. It becomes increasingly difficult to identify how a particular relation is an, is in fact part of a frontier mechanism. So I'm trying to operate in constructing kind of narratives or, or a matrix of narration in which images and words, a story, a history, and iconographies permanently unsettle each other. I try to always do that by constructing, by jumping from one perspective to another, which is the first sort of that middle position of the very first image, that middle position of you know, ambiguity where for a moment you don't know who acts on whom and you realize that perhaps it's from the middle that this scene is co-constituted, right? And that is sort of the, the ontological, epistemological shift currently on vogue, right? To trying to no longer kind of depart from discrete substances and uh, stable, um, 
uh, ontological partitions, but rather look at boundary making practices and mediation as constituting it from the middle, right? that middle kingdom in Latourian speak. Um, but the middle kingdom and it's kind of, you know, giving priority over to mediation over relative stabilities. Um, the Middle Kingdom itself does not provide us with the, the tools of a critical language. And I think that for readers of Latour and related, um, related uh, tendencies, uh, probably something that, you, that, that is the kind of strange depolitization or, you know, like a, a kind of um, inability to, to put the political move into political practice. In, just think of the parliament of things, right? A kind of animist, almost Disney kind of idea, no? Like of things, like an unbounded sociality in which basically the very move of unbounding it consists the prime gesture, but it is no, not literate about the boundaries that are that would be in practice despite the gesture of unbounding. Right? And I think in as being part and formed by um, colonial frontiers, as we all are, um, this very inability it's, is itself part of the of the frontier, right? Like the the inability um, in this kind of planetary mediality, um, in which everything dissolves into relationalities, to to exactly describe the breaking points um, and the 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 utter the utter otherness of relations, like. It's this is something that um, you know the kind of hyper visibility of of globalization from the nine this kind of idea of uh, um, you know of kind of a, um, a post histoire of uh, of the network society that was kind of a collective intoxication in the in the nineties. Um, producing this kind of image of a of a of a real time representability of everything, no? of kind of real time access to everything. So, so the fact you know this, this kind of to even be able to step outside the matrix of the game right, is at stake right now, like um, because the very the very kind of um, creation of inter subjective relations and medialities in itself has already been captured. So <clears throat> maybe I just show you a few moments from the animism exhibition to conclude my last three minutes. Um, the main driving engine of the animism exhibition was to look at the way colonial frontiers related to this making of objects and the kind of exportation mechanisms of internal divides into both imaginary and real outsides. And so imaginary outsides in terms of, you know, the imaginary say of Orientalism or primitivisms of various kinds, um, real outsides in terms of, you know, actual colonial practices. Um, this export of internal divides that separate, that establish certain relations between um, speaking subjects and non-speaking objects into categories um, of the colonial, turning them into operators of the frontier itself. So this was the main driving. This, uh, um, then the second main platform was to look at how the the particular sort of objectivism of of the Cartesian period, let's say, um, 
in which, you know, to quote Viveros de Castro, like to know is to de to de to know is to objectify, that means to desubjectify. <laughs> yeah. um, this this kind of configuration of knowledge and its articulation also in institutions such as the museum, obviously, like the museum a paradigmatic place for such desubjectification, um, at the same time real, yields in a way a kind of compensatory theater of negativity, of you know the return of the repressed, the kind of and that's the, the haunted stage of, of early modern media, no? like the haunted in being populated by all the effects of unruly and anarchic medialities and figure ground inversions that this objectivist regime forecloses. Right? So there's a kind of direct relation between border making practices, institutional or otherwise, and the very form and the very iconography that modern media take in, you know, specifically in the period where the, defin the distinction between technological media and the understanding of media as carrier, right, like as, as a material carrier or a technological carrier, and people as mediums, no, as being mediums either of spirits, of kinds, or of their very milieu. This distinction was fundamentally unstable all through the 19th century until the first decades of the 20th century. So this, the instability of that distinction provides us with, it is important to go back to that point because that's a point where one can re-understand and maybe regain a language over the passive vector, and over the, what it means to be acted upon. Um, <clears throat> the Hayao Miyazaki, Japanese animator that is probably familiar to all of you, um, in this exhibition is an important um, reference also, on the, you know, on the one hand because of course, and this is not the only one reference that is made to a kind of um, Shinto animist ja Japanese realm that is just extremely unique, almost completely unique in the configuration of modernity because the relationship between animist ontologies, which is just, you know, whatever ontology that doesn't adhere to what Euro-American um, configurations, whatever difference in making subject-object distinctions um, qualifies as animist, yeah? like there's no more precise definition of what's animism at all. Um, in Japan, the state and animism coexist. Everywhere else, the state is the, the operator of the anti-animist frontier, you know, that, of this strange coupling that Adorno and Horkheimer describe so breathtakingly of enlightenment, being the disenchantment of the world, disenchantment of the world being the extirpation of animism. It's kind of um, striking description of, of the frontier in their terms, but coupling um, animism with genocide again. Hayao Miyazaki in this Ponyo tale is describing, and this is maybe my concluding note here, is describing um, an ontological crossing right, in the medium that is perhaps closest to ontological anarchy, animation, animated film, simply because in animation a line can become, can become everything. You know, sort of it's, it has this kind of ontological anarchy of the protoplasm or what, what uh, the, the cell that, that can become any that can still that is not yet specialized. That's basically the kind of synesthetic cell and the multipotent cell per definition. In this dream of the multipotent cell and you know, the ability to become anything is of course both inscribed a history of utopia and of terror. Um, just as one could read Alice in Wonderland as both um, a text on 
enchantment and transformation as just as well as pure political terror. You know, the ontological upset, the pulling the ontological carpet that that is the creates this kind of instability of the ontological insecurity that is the prime characterization of systematic political terror that is very close to this definition of ontological insecurity as you know r d lying brought forward you know, kind of now this tale of ponyo is an ontological crossing simply because of one organism be turning into something else a fish becoming a human by mere by the fact that some human recognized humanity in that fish right the little boy looking etc so and then this becoming this inevitable becoming um, human somehow upsets the entire geography of relative stabilities and relative mobilities, meaning the entire ecology, right? The ecological order, um, heaven and the earth, right? tsunami, earthquake, um, storm, etc. Until after that crossing is achieved and somehow things settle back into a kind of strange vision of um, a feminized ecological harmony, an extremely romantic um, um, image for that matter. Mm. Of course, nothing such as ontological anarchy for us ever exists, right? It's like, it's a point of reference only as a as an analytical starting point, you know, the one that would allow us to think through things in ways that do not take any ontological partition, and that is obviously the key question of this ontological turn in anthropology, a priori for granted. Like the ability to even think beyond the taken for grantedness, you know, the tacit assumption that already acts out a number of divisions, a number of partitions, delegations, etc. Um, and the tool by which I think one can advance in thinking from that starting point of potential medialities, unlimited by definition, but in dire need of precise historization, is in in these terms of of an expanded definition of figure and ground as a way of addressing configurations of mediality, by which I mean, you know, realms of sociality and realms of acting and being acted upon. Okay, that's it for the morning. Thanks for listening. <laughs>
I don't, I don't really have an answer to that. I think that's pretty much the argument that Zizek makes in the ticklish subject. Um, but I, it's too long ago that I read it and can bind it, because there's, it's full of interesting, um, an in, really a brilliant defense of Cartesianism um, as a kind of anti-holism, as a kind of, I, I don't really know what to say about that, just that I... It was more like something um, to add to the form. Yeah. I also thought in relation that when you mentioned the, the, the kind of the desire to perceive ourselves as totally immanent mm -hmm. and how, um, whereas kind of the key thing, as, as arguing as an artist, like the key thing, there's a hole in the imminent, immanence and that's the material of making art. That's the kind of, the, I would say, the prime of course. kind of thing, of course. Of course. what we have to encounter the groundlessness, what we have to encounter, eternity, the finite, and all that. I mean, the, the big question is, you know, groundlessness with sovereignty, or what form of sovereignty, or what constitutes sovereignty, perhaps something like literacy, an ability to, to a space of agency in, let's say, in this abstract language of figure-ground relations, of undoing grounds and figures, and and also um, understanding their their very coming into being and you know ability like stabilities and instabilities. Um, you know the the big question is: Is there something like a literacy for for this kind of rather than rather than kind of undoing? You know the givenness of being in relation. How do you proceed to a language of of working on being or, or being worked on, but in in a sense that constitutes? Because on groundlessness, I mean, just to pick up with the lying thing, no? Like it is a pathological condition for the people that lying talks about. But he he phrases it interestingly. Uh, or let's see, you, it, it's not lying. It's it's Mello Ponti who who gives this in a very interesting this and the idea of ontological groundlessness and ontological insecurity, a very interesting twist that I think is just this kind of figure ground inversion that we permanently have to um, kind of use as an operator in order to understand frontier mechanisms and within the field of mediality. And this twist is that he says what, what psychotics that experience ontological insecurity lack is a kind of, is the basic ability to um, what he called, what Meloponti I think calls perceptual faith, to believe in the stability of what is perceived. Yeah? There's an ontological confusion as to how stable is that shit world, how stable am I as a subject in it, right? It's a figure ground confusion that is pathological because it's a loss of sovereignty. Um, it's very close otherwise to all kind of other ways of mobilizing figure ground relations, let's say, through LSD experience or whatever. Eh? Like, uh, um, <clears throat> but then Melo Ponti goes on to say that it's actually, it's a lack of tolerance for ambiguity. Um, lack of perceptual faith is a lack of tolerance for ambiguity. It's a lack of tolerance of the fact that the imaginary real nexus is always a continuum and that you cannot say what is object, what is subject ever for one, once and for all, right? You can only open up this continuum and and develop forms of agency and sovereignty in, in it. You know? So I think this kind of idea of the lack of ambiguity is incredibly important. I mean, on the kind of backdrop of, of you know, this whole kind of horror of identitarian, uh, neo-positivist um, ideologies surrounding us today.
I, I was, I mean, if I understood well, there was uh, an assessment of of the animism exercise and a, and a bit of a, a negative or a, or a, or a yeah, uh, not failure is a heavy word, but I mean, if animism comes as a result of this inability to objectify, but animism doesn't produce, doesn't come with uh, um, a critical language, right? So the conclusion is that the exercise may be a failure. But throughout the whole discussion, there was a, a, a reference to a we and an us. And it also came with a certain set of demands that seemed to come with this we and us, with criticism, certain ontological clarity. And it also came with a discussion of frontiers in relation to some incorporation, which seems to also refer to an us. So the question is, what is this us? Because maybe it's the definition of this us that, that necessarily leads you to a, a, a negative conclusion in relation to animism. Because maybe this us and the way it's defined can't, can't actually embrace or, 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 or incorporate, that's really maybe the wrong word, can't really deal with what animism means. Yeah, because I because there's, agree. There's, there's things that are left over there that you yeah. that, that you can't let go. Yeah, I completely agree. I completely agree. Um, and I would always try to keep this in mind. No, like um, this is one of the kind of operations one need to permanently do. Like again, to move out of the, to not charge the us with, with the task of. Um, I, I still, uh, I, I still kind of, uh, you know, when when I when I do exhibitions of this kind of that, that try to bring discourses and iconographies into a delirious relation, because they are brought into somehow to their frontier qualities and you know what it does to signifiers and signifieds and so on, um, start to uh, mob, be mobilized, um, is really, as I said at the beginning, totally like the prime concern is to understand the, this kind of condition of possibility of, you know, like, because it has to talk to, a, to an us, right, an exhibition. It has to create an us, but it also has to talk to an us. It has to talk to the way, you know, collective horizons and and epochal dream conditions, dreaming collectives, in, in uh, if one will. So, like, if you don't address, you know, um, the status of an image within that realm of the of uh, the collective or an us. Then you also don't identify its uh, its position within a frontier. I mean, it's, it's, but maybe it's very simple. This, but um, maybe the the activism of animism in in Belgium, Germany, uh, would operate differently from the activism the activation of animism in Brazil. So Brazil, yes. That, I mean, but then, yeah, and then maybe, yeah. I mean, it's maybe that it's not that simple, but it applies to that. You know how. I mean, that us is also, I mean, the us in the art context is a really complicated us, but the us in the West is maybe also complicated us. But uh, the us as uh, this um, civilizatory, you know, collapse is a different us, which is not that. So all these different course, we's yeah. uh, don't necessarily uh, operate in the same level. This is not an exhibition that uh, uh, responds to or, or feels res responsive, responsible to the art world, no, it's it's it does not. It tries to speak to something else, while at the same time affirming the space of art as a as a space where one can negotiate this. I think this is uh, you know like where you can look at boundary making practices without falling victim to them. Or so like this is what it's it's like an optical device for breaking these things open and. Uh, or like something like an opt a device of sorts, no? um, while you know you 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 from within that affirmation you have to of course just point at its limits and make it communicate with with other 
with other histories accommodate other experiences just you know even to 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 show the the limits of what can be represented what experience can be accessed i think is in a very important experience right particularly in the, in when you deal with extremely effective images images that are you know both from this kind of repressed colonial lie of which your american culture is engulfed and this kind of the effective language of animation um the the exhibition was happening in you know place where the history this us is fundamentally different from a euro american us but colonized totally uh, to a large degree you know korea where it was perhaps the most interesting because uh, you know still in the 1970s under military dictatorship the kind of you know the animist practices in, in korea where where sort of had to be sacrificed for modern progress right so there was a movement called the new village movement where where the modernizers were making the shamans and other uh, uh, spiritual practitioners of all kinds basically publicly burn their uh, effigies and uh, altars and so on and and within within three decades this is now very different right there is a kind of huge revival of shamanism as a national heritage as a nation building thing as a kind of expensive middle class practice you know when you when you have a lot of money you go to the shaman as well um, and you uh, you contribute to koreanness when you do so it's an extreme interesting shift uh, like that i think i haven't fully understood or or understood is anyway the wrong word but uh we managed with the exhibition at least to talk to that shift in in ways that was extremely interesting about the construction of of us in the sense of how can an experience that is not part of an us be be made to communicate with you know other experiences etc but then again there is a kind of you know the 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 us that i was talking about here is 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 more of the 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 techno frontier of it's an infrastructural frontier. It's not an ideological frontier. It's what I tried to say with, with the techno-environmentalism, that maybe we talk that way because of the... I'm not, I'm not a media determinist, but there is a kind of... There is an us that is larger than the Euro-Western, right? It's, it's, it is an us that, in, that is much more constructed by the way liquid crystals communicate with us. <laughs> With us, with meaning, with everybody with whom they communicate, <laughs> um, and this us and its epistemological, you know, what it can, you know, it's it's the kind of now of recognizability because, you know, for this is a beautiful term because it const it it delineates a field of of what 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 comes into view, you know, um, and this is changing so radically at the moment. Um, and I think that maybe you know this kind of discovery of that which was outside of the modern objectivist regime, repeating this 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 rediscovery or so like or like may 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 sometimes make us unattentive to the to the like I I will just say like I I'm not critical of this at all. I said that I always think that it just has to be a starting point. No? Like the, it is not, it is not in any way a conclusion. You can't move towards animism. You have to depart from it in order to be precise. <laughs> but then it's urgent to be to start to develop languages of precision from from then on, right? Um, and the singularity or utter ungovernability of you know everything that happens outside this us is something completely different this is a source of other sovereignties and and so on they, they need to be brought into relation with whatever us one then um, seeks to invoke igual igual tenemos que pasar la próxima o una 10 minutos y continuamos hablando fuera también si alguna persona tiene algo que decir se puede Uh, cerrar. Muchas gracias. Anson.